And so we're on week three of this Jonah series, and we've tracked Jonah. I mean, he, he's been given a direction. He didn't really follow through with it, and uh, he felt like this was an interruption in his life. And so he took his, his own path. He boarded this ship bound for Tarshish when God had clearly told him to go in the other direction. And we find out that on this ship, he gets tossed overboard, and uh, uh, God provides this fish to swallow him up, and he's in the worst kind of bottom of the barrel situation, and there's nowhere to look. We found last week that when you're in the bottom of the barrel, there's nowhere really to look but up, right? You can't, you can't get any much lower, and that is where Jonah found himself. Now, the question I want to look at here today is this, this idea of what, what is the way to a second chance, I mean, Jonah obviously needs a second chance here. And how, how do you get to a second chance? And, and really, once you're there, what do you need to do to, to embrace it? Uh, what do you do to embrace a second chance? You might feel like you're at one of those, or a third chance, or a fourth chance, or a tenth chance. But how do you get to a second chance and kind of like hone in on it and, and embrace it? Well, I, I don't know if you can relate with this, but if you are anything like me, I mean, you, you, you will get this, right? I mean, Guys specifically, it, it's those times in your lives where your wife, your girlfriend, your mother, your friend asks you to do something or, or, or actually maybe says, don't do this thing. And you, because you are a man, because we can do anything, you decide to go ahead and do it anyways. You know what I'm talking about? Like for me, this usually uh, c comes about when uh, I want to fix something. And so something's broken in our home and I want to fix it. And Emily's like, well, I don't think you should do that because you have never fixed something like that before. And maybe you should call a professional. But for me, it's like, no, I don't need to call a professional because I, I am he. I, I am the professional. So I can fix that microwave, washing machine, car, well, whatever it is, I can fix it. I'm going to have the tools to do it, but I, I will fix that thing, all right? Or for me, it, it's something like I can build it, right? Even though I don't own this particular tool, you know, my kids want something, I will build that thing. You, you, want, you want a coffee table? I will build you a coffee table. You want this? I will build you this thing. And it's like an epic fail, right? Like, but, but I can do it even though my wife tells me, I, you know, I don't know, I don't know if you should do that. Or, or for me, it comes about in sports. And so I have a, I have a sport. I want to play hockey, even though, uh, you know, both my ACLs are torn and I need a, need a knee replacement. It's like, no, I'm going to go play hockey. And she's like, well, do you think that's the best idea? Yeah, of course it's the best idea because, because I'm a man, right? Like I can, I can do that. I can play hockey and I don't need someone telling me that I can't do this. And then sometimes, I mean, just, just the odd time, it's, it's not usual, but sometimes my plans backfire. I mean, they don't go really how I thought they would necessarily go. And maybe, maybe sometimes she's right in what she told me or asks of me. And I think Jonah is kind of realizing this in his life right now. He, he's understanding this, this kind of idea that, that, he had this, this great plan to hop on this ship and head to Tarshish. And it's not, it's not really working out the way he, he thought it would. And so he's still not thrilled about going to Nineveh. He's still not thrilled about going and following through with God's direction on him and what God has asked him to do. Um, and, and he can't really believe that God would use him in any kind of assignment, but he, he's succumbed to that. And we find out what his, his stance on it is in chapter 2 in the book of Jonah now. And he's chosen to, to run away in rebellion, and that somehow, even though he's been rebellious, God still leads him to go to Nineveh to, to, to have a second chance to go there and follow through with the original plan that God asked him to do. And what we find out is that Jonah is the first ever missionary. He's the first guy. He's the first missionary to go from the, 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 the motherland and, and head off into another direction and minister to, to pagans. He's, he is the first one. He is the first recorded missionary. I mean, he's a reluctant missionary, but he's still the first recorded missionary, Jonah, going to Nineveh. I mean, have you ever made decisions that have led you down a path of rebellion? that have led you down a path that you knew you were not supposed to go. And, and I, guess, I guess my encouragement for you today as we start is that you are never too far from the grasp of grace of God. He is always there. He is always chasing. He, he is always longing for you to turn 
back to him. And you have never overstepped the boundaries of his mercy. It's always there for you. And uh, if you've chosen to abandon the pathway, the direction that God has, has told you to go, and you're realizing that, and, 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 and maybe, maybe you're realizing that and you say, you know what, I want to yield to this divine intervention. I'm not going to see it as an interruption. I'm going to see it as this divine work, and you've yielded to that. Let me tell you, if you've come to that spot, even through this series the last few weeks, God is celebrating with you today. He is celebrating you turning back to him and heading for this second chance. Now, I said we'd answer this question, well, what, what are, what are the way, what's the way to a second chance? And I think the first point we really need to highlight here, when we get to a second chance, the way to a second chance is that there are no shortcuts. We've got to understand this, right? It's the first point here today. There's no shortcuts. There isn't. Now, I, I enjoy, uh, well, I, I don't know, I, I wouldn't say I really enjoy texting, but here's what I do love about texting. That when you text now, because my fingers are so fat and my, and my phone is so small, I can't, I can't really get all that I want to get in there really quickly. And so they have those new three words that come up, and it's just kind of like a guess. Do you want to use this word, this word, or this word? I love that. I love that because it's less texting for me. But oftentimes, what ends up happening when, when, when you're not really paying attention or you're not really good at texting is that your phone auto-corrects you. And when that happens, if you can relate, there's some things that get lost kind of in the texting translation. Uh, I picked out a few ones from the internet. You can find these all over. But here's a few of these, right? Here's this conversation that happened. Do you still need help sewing? I, I can come over on Sunday. No, no, I urinated in my pants today. I urinated in my pants. She's trying to correct it, right? I, I heard you. Why? Are you okay? I'm trying to stay, stay un, I'm trying to say unhemmed. I did not pee myself. And I was worried for a second, right? Or, or this one. Check out this one. I had, I had a huge tag sale this weekend and made $450. Nice. I'm selling my father's organs. <laughs> Should make a pretty penny. Selling his organs? What? I, I'm, I'm sure that's illegal. No, his organs? Uh, no, no, no. He's, he, it's, it's, it's like auto-correcting this stuff. Or, or this one. Check out this one. I'm sorry. I should have told you sooner. I'm mad. I, I, I don't want you to keep squirrel meat from me. Squirrel meat? Well, uh, that lightened the mood, didn't it? Secrets out, right? It's just this, this squirrel meat. I mean, it's this autocorrect, this idea of autocorrecting and trying to take the shortcut from actually writing the same thing. And here's the deal now. Here's what I love. In my Gmail account, it's not just autocorrecting. It actually gives me replies. So I don't even have to, you, you write me an email, I don't even have to write you back. I, I just press like this auto reply. It gives me a couple options of what I want to say. He, being an introvert, this is amazing for me because you know the direction that this is heading. Soon, this will be a glorious day when we actually don't have to talk and you can have a conversation with my computer. I won't even need to talk. It'll just talk for me. It'll have a conversation with you. Better yet, two computers will have conversations with each other, and we'll just sit there like in a, in a stupor, just, just kind of like sitting there. While our computers have talk, this conversation with each other, we won't even need to be present. That is like a glorious day for any introvert, right? It's absolutely amazing. But here's the deal. Sometimes when we get a second chance, we want to find the easiest road to complete obedience. Sometimes we want, to, we want to press that shortcut key to avoid any kind, any kind of difficult scenario or, or the hard road or, or the difficult path, especially when it's, it seems like it's going to take longer than normal. And so let's jump into Jonah chapter 3, verse 1. All right, to start out here. Here's what it says. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim it to it, the message I give you. Proclaim to it the message I give you. And so Jonah decides to go with God's plan. After his plan, you know, he ends up in the gut of a fish. And so he's like, you know what? I think I'm going to go with God's plan here. He decides to do that in chapter two. And God commands this huge fish to, to spit Jonah out, out on shore the Bible doesn't really record exactly where this takes place, but um, in all probability, the fish spits Jonah out on the shores of Joppa, right where Jonah started. 
And, and I'm sure after Jonah is like disorientated, he's sticky, he's smelly, he comes to his sentence after, senses after being like stuck in the dark for so long, he, he's up on shore, he kind of looks around, and he's, he's amazed that he's still alive, but he must have been startled when he got his bearings to realize that he is the exactly same spot that he started. And uh, <laughs> he's realizing there's no shortcut to this thing. I'm going to have to start at square one. There's no getting out if it's God's will. See, Joppa, Joppa is the place of decisions. Joppa is the crossroads of obedience. It's the starting place of second chances. It's the place where we either follow through with God's obedience or we head our own direction. And even with a second chance, we still get that decision. Which way are we going to go? What represents Joppa in your situation? What is the crossroads of obedience in your life? See, Jonah is back at Joppa and he realizes it's 800 kilometers to Nineveh. See, he's going to have to put one foot in front of the other in order to get there. And that's not always the most fun situation when you know you have to walk 800K, right? Which leads me to point number two, is this, one step at a time. If you're embracing a second chance, if you're, if you're, if you're at the crossroads of decision, you want to take that step towards God's will, then you've got to take it one step at a time. There's no shortcuts, and, and, and it's going to be a long road, but you've got, to, you've got to embrace that and put one foot in front of the other to move ahead. Now, Emily and I, we live on about two acres, and uh, two acres full of beautiful trees. Uh, we, we, we love them. Few, two acres full of, of, of beautiful trees that, um, that drop leaves uh, for about a few months. I mean, two acres of beautiful trees that drop leaves for about two months that yours truly has to rake up. And let me tell you, it is an absolute pain to rake up two acres full of leaves. Like, it's, 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 it's awful. It's an awful situation. And, and, and so last year, I was asking several of you, in fact, I'm actually blaming you, and, and several of you said, you know what, Ben, just mow over your leaves. That's all you do. Just, just mow over your leaves. And I'm like, great, that sounds excellent, because raking takes me like 30 hours of raking to get all these leaves, put them in a pile, and to get rid of them. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. And so I get on my tractor. I'm, I'm driving my tractor. I am mowing. I'm just mowing these leaves to uh, obliterating these leaves with my lawnmower, all right? But here's the deal. I got two acres full of trees that, that, that have leaves that fall. And eventually, I have more trees than you must have trees, okay? Because I am mowing my lawn. And my lawnmower, instead of obliterating these leaves, eventually I have so many leaves that it's turning into, not like a snow plow, it's turning into a leaf plow. And I'm just plowing leaves all over the place with my lawnmower. They're getting clogged in my, in my, uh, in my, in my uh, blades, and, and I, I, can't, I can't do anything. And it's getting so late in the season that the snow is starting to fall. And eventually I find myself stuck when a snowstorm comes that there's a whole bunch of leaves all over the ground and the snow is going over top of the leaves and winter takes hold. And I'm thinking about those leaves. Think about those leaves. And then spring comes. And as the snow begins to melt, I am seeing, guess what's right under the snow? Yeah, it's not grass. It's the leaves. The leaves are all over the place. And so... And so what once was a, an enjoying 30 hours of raking crinkly light leaves has turned into this absolute nightmare from hell where I have to take these leaves that are drenched and decomposing and smelly and disgusting and I'm raking all these, I can't even rake actually because they're so heavy. I'm picking them up and I'm carrying them over and it's taking me forever, absolute nightmare. And it's your fault because you told me to do this, right? Absolute nightmare. And uh, it's because I didn't do it right the first time. And I find myself in this situation, and it seems harder than ever before. And, and, and it kind of, it reminds me of Jonah's situation. In fact, let's take a look at what God originally asks Jonah to do in Jonah 1 verse 2. Here's what he asks him to do. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. That's what God asked him to do right at the beginning of the book of Jonah, right? Right at the beginning. And Jonah does his own thing. He's like, I know better. I can do this. I'm a man. I'm going to go do my own thing. 
And he comes full circle and, uh, and he says, you know what? It didn't actually work out. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow you. I'm going to follow through with what you asked me to do. And God says, okay, let's go back to see what I asked you to do. And God says this in uh, Jonah 3 verse 2. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. It sounds similar here, doesn't it? Well, the destination and the mission, they're the same. The, the directives, they're, they're slightly different, right? He didn't follow through the first time, and so, and so the directives are a little bit different than they were at the beginning. See, in chapter 1, the directions were clear. God told Jonah exactly what to do on Assyrian soil. Here's exactly what I want you to do. And then when Jonah receives it the second time, he, he still knew it would require a one-way ticket out of town. He knew that. But uh, he knew the proclamation had to be made. But, but he received a really vague understanding of what he needed to do. In fact, what God is asking Jonah to do is to go first, then I'll tell you what's going to go down. You go without all the instructions. And once you get there, I will give it to you. See, both commands require detail, but one requires greater measure of faith, doesn't it? See, listen, you, you might be on your first chance, you might be on your second chance, you might be on your third, your tenth chance. But when God asks for full obedience, sometimes that, that means you don't know the details before you go. See, ask him. Ask him to give you this measure of faith required to move forward in your step-by-step journey to Nineveh. Which leads me to the next point. See, the way to embrace a second chance, the way to a second chance is to make things right. To make things right. Now, I don't know if you've heard this phrase. I hear it often. It's this motto that a lot of people live by, and it's this. Act first, apologize later. Act first, <laughs> apologize later. You, you ever heard that phrase? I mean, these are the people who think that, you know, I, I, I know what is right. I'm going to go ahead and do this thing, and I'm not going to ask for permission to do it. And if it's wrong, then I will go back and I'll ask for forgiveness. And so I'm going to do what I want now, and I'm going to face the repercussions later, just, just because I think I know what's right anyways, and so I'm not going to go through the proper channels. I'm just going to get this thing done because I'm task-oriented, right? I just want to get this thing done without going through the proper channels in the proper ways, right? But is that the way God calls us to live? To, to make amends instead of living rightly and making it right? You see, God commanded that fish to vomit Jonah up on the shores of Joppa. It it It, 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 it does. And he's at the crossroads of Joppa, the crossroads of decision, right? And there he stood, dripping wet and no doubt disorientated, and God gives him this new direction, new direction. It's the same mission, but new direction to go to Nineveh. And while this seems straightforward enough, we need, we need to, to know, we need to understand that at the time, this is a little bit confusing for Jonah, because at the time, Jonah would normally take a different course of action before he would go to Nineveh. See, here's what I mean. If you take a look at Jonah chapter 2, when Jonah's trying to get back on board with God's plan, Jonah chapter 2 verse 9, Jonah says this, But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will sacrifice to you. See, sacrifices and vows that Jonah offered to, to make in Jerusalem, it's, near, it's, it's not just like a thanksgiving type of, 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 of visible, visible thing that he's trying to do. This is an atonement for the bad that he's done. Because we know that this is the way the Old Testament worked, right? You, 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 you did something that you knew was wrong, and for, for forgiveness, to get repentance for that, you would make a sacrifice to God. And that's, that's exactly what Jonah's talking about here. He, he, he thought he needed to, to kind of uh, make amends, that he needed to undo what he did. And the only way to do that was to make a sacrifice in Jerusalem before he followed through with the directions from God. It was a mandated necessity for God's people to remain in fellowship with him. And so that's why it's odd here that when Jonah gets thrown up on shore, 
He goes straight to Nineveh instead of Jerusalem. See, making it right by going to Nineveh, it's, it's more important than making amends. When God leads you to do something, even though you know that the way you've been living has not been good, when God tells you to do something, you obey him. You don't make amends. You make it right. And uh, I think it can be tempting, right? It can be tempting for us. See, God, for Jonah, chapter 2 is all God needed. But for us, sometimes what we think we need to do is I need to be good before I go to Nineveh. I need to somehow my good will replace the bad that I've done. Somehow my attendance at church is going to replace the bad decisions between church, right? Somehow that I need to check off this box to make sure that I'm doing all these things, right? In order to please God before I follow through with his directives on my life. Here's what I think. Here's what I think. God would rather us be right with him and focus on obedience over rebellion. He wants us to live in a right way rather than making mistakes and and jumping into sin and then always going back to him and seeking forgiveness. See, the Old Testament, God allowed sacrifices to serve as the atonement for sin, but, but that's not God's ultimate desire, right? It's not what his desire is, is that we do all these bad things and then make sacrifices, make sacrifices, make sacrifices, and then run back to the temple, seek forgiveness, right? And then do bad things, bad things, run back to the temple, seek forgiveness. It's not the way he wants you to live. He doesn't want you to constantly run back. It's the same for us. Listen, I think we, I think we all know that it's much easier to repent later than submit now. And God is calling you to complete obedience. And obedience requires self-denial. And unlike, unlike the Old Testament, or, or maybe even some denominations and churches today, God wants you to live in right relationship rather than trying to cover up all the sin that you did between Sundays. In fact, I love this scripture. It's, it is a blunt, it's a doozy. It's a doozy. Isaiah 1, 13 to 16 reads like this. Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbath convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals hate with all my being. I hate it with all my being. They've become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I'm not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourself clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. And there it is. It's as simple as can be. See, in what ways right now are you seeking to cover up, to compensate, to make amends, to replace disobedience with your worthless assembly? See, sometimes I think we got the wrong idea that if I can check the box, if I come on Sundays and I'm here and, and, and whatever, that's, that somehow undoes the garbage that I live by throughout my week. Instead of living in right relationship and putting him number one in your life, in your time, in your finances, that living by him in complete obedience, that somehow trying to, trying to overcompensate is the same thing and it's not. In fact, what I would say is you're, you're headed back down onto that boat to Tarshish. And in fact, let, let's just put it like this. See, this is, this is where we are. And, and, and Joppa is that crossroads. God leads you to do something. He puts Nineveh in your sights and it's far away and it looks like it's a difficult situation and you might have to jump into it just like, just like uh, jump into a past hurt just like Jonah did, right? And going to Nineveh, but it's this crossroad and he gives you a decision. Are you going to follow through with what I've called you to do, what I'm leading you to do? Or are you going to take your own route, which usually leads to a spiral, doesn't it? 
usually leads to a spiral, and you end up in places like Tarshish because it keeps going lower and lower and lower. When you get to the bottom of the barrel, you begin to look up and you realize, you know what? You know what, God, you are the only way. You are the author of life. You are the only saving grace that I have. I mean, I got to turn to you. There's no other way to turn. And you get back to a second chance to Joppa. And you get this decision again, this decision, this crossroads of obedience. And am I going to take this thing? And this is the second chance. And and God is asking you, are you going to take this second chance? Are you going to to, to avoid the shortcuts? Are you going to live kind of step by step? Are you going to live out in faith even if you don't know where you're going or how this is all going to play out? Are you going to head towards Nineveh? Are you going to try to do it your own way by overcompensating and trying to cover up by, by worthless assemblies? Because I'm telling you, it's easy to get tempted to go back into the spiral. And God says, I need complete obedience from you. I need you to follow through with what I'm asking you to do. And so my my question for you is, what is God asking you? What is your Nineveh? What is he asking you to do? What is your Joppa right now in the decision that you need to make in moving forward? And is 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 there something you're trying to hide here? Let's pray. Father, we just, uh, once again, just Jonah is just so relatable here. And when it's laid out in, in plain, plain as day kind of idea, we can really understand your word. And, it, and it's, just, it's just life-giving. It's life-changing. It's life-altering here. Father, we want to be full and, and, and lead a lives worthy of your calling. And God, you've, you've placed callings on our lives. You, you've placed things before us. You've placed Nineveh's in front of us. And And Father, we pray for your strength as we press into that. God, we we, we want to to give you all that we have and seek your forgiveness day by day, but we want to really live in complete obedience. So Father, we turn ourselves over to you, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen.